Back here in Jacksonville at Seabass Field, rules of the game are running clock until the final minute of each half. The field 50 yards by 85 feet. No punting, no outside stunning or twisting. The ball off the net is live. One wide out can be in forward motion before the snap. Brandon Tompkins, one of the most electrifying returners in the Arena Football League. Three kickoff return touchdowns this season, second in the AFL, getting some encouragement as we begin. Encouragement from the opposing fans in Jacksonville tonight. And here we go, Tompkins takes the short kickoff. Out across the five, a speed crosses the 10 and chopped out at the 13. Solid return on the opening touch for the Orlando Predators as he picks up 17. Bernard Morris is the quarterback for the Preds. 974 yards through the air, 21 touchdowns, only three picks. In his four starts this season, 32 total touchdowns because 11 of those have come on the ground. So Morris and the Orlando offense out there first. Motion man is Brandon Tompkins. Over the middle, it's caught by Brandon across the 20. And a nice pickup of nine on first down as we check out the offense for the Orlando Predators. Okay, this is a really big physical offensive line. They do a nice job up front. Earl Latson, Maxwell, and Hayworth Nix leads that group. Brandon Tompkins. Could be up for MVP this year, offensive MVP, great player. A guy that can do it a bunch of different ways. 60 receptions, 13 TDs, he is definitely a threat. Number one in all-purpose yardage in the AFL, 192 yards per game for Brandon Tompkins. He's out there with Kendall Tompkins on second and short. Over the top, got a man caught, touchdown. On two plays, they score this one to Kendall Tompkins, 28 yards in Orlando on the board first. They're going to catch him in man-to-man -man coverage. And he's just going to beat him on the post route. But watch what he does. He steepens up, and Art throws the ball upfield, which is a perfect throw. Sometimes you get those young DBs that want to undercut routes. Nice job of steepening up and continuing on to find it. And that's a tough over-the-shoulder catch by Tompkins there. So Tompkins and Tompkins. <laughs> the Tompkins twins. It's kind of been the story offensively for the Preds this season. The extra point. He's up and good from Mark Lewis. 7-0 Orlando, nearly two minutes deep. And Rob Keefe, you heard him in the interview before the game. He's always jacked up, and this is a good way for his offense to begin. It really is. Two for two for Bernard in here with a nice teardrop into the post. Kendall Tompkins, tell you what, he is a force to be reckoned with. They just got to keep him in the lineup. He is a dangerous receiver. 65th catch for Kendall this year, 15th touchdown. And for Morris, he fires his 22nd touchdown through the air. The number three scoring offense in the league, 58 points per game for the Orlando Predators. And number one in total offense, 311 yards per game. Tell you what, you know, that's one thing that doesn't happen. You know, you know Coach Sia Burley, offense coordinator, doesn't get enough credit for the great work he does with getting this team prepared week in and week out. And they come out and perform. Regardless, they've had several guys in and out of the lineup, but they just continue to keep coming in and performing. Speaking of electrifying returners, that's Larachi Jackson to take the kick from Lewis. Jackson picked up about a month into the season. He was just kind of hanging around after leading Cleveland to the Arena Bowl last year. So Jackson back deep, and this one goes through. So a touchback for Jacksonville as they go on offense for the first time tonight. And we just heard from him moments ago, the 6'7", 240-pound quarterback, Tommy Grady. He is a big, big guy, can over, oversee the line and just has a, the knack to get the ball out of his hands. Great timing. You won't see him stand back there patting the ball, trying to wait for somebody to get open. But he is efficient with it, gets it out, and he's starting to hit his rhythm. Just one interception in his last four games. He's right on time getting together with that offense. Five and five for the Sharks. They've won four in a row, five of their last six. After starting the season, 0 oh and four. Quick strike over the middle on the slant. A nice job to hold on to that football for a gain of six on first down. And the offensive starters here for the Sharks. 
We look at the big fellas up front doing a good job, but the main threat, Tiger Jones is having an all-star type season this year. 81 receptions, over 1,100 yards and 22 touchdowns, averaging 14 yards per catch. And you will see, if he gets in the end zone, you will see some of the most exciting, <laughs> electrifying dances you've ever seen. That's important in the AFL. It is, you gotta have fun. On second down, quick strike near side, nice catch off the deflection. Near boards by Tiger Jones, his 82nd catch of the season. And a pickup of six and a first down. And the defense for the Predators. And these guys get after you. They're very physical, led by their safety, who's a first-year starter inside in the middle at the safety spot, Nick Taylor. 49 tackles, one interception, 11 P PBUs, pass breakups. Guys, very physical, and that's what this team plays with. A lot of physicality when you're going up against receivers that want to get out in space and run. They make it tough on you because they put the smack on you. High motion man was Jones all day. Slung across to the far side. Mm -hmm. Joe Hills with his second catch of this opening drive, and he gains 18. And this is one of those learning curves with Tommy Grady, learning his receivers, Joe Hills, who's having a, a tremendous year as well. That's his 89th catch of the year. These guys are starting to learn each other. The little nuances that they bring collectively, I tell you what, they're extremely talented. It's just a matter of time. And like I said, they've been rolling the last three, four weeks, playing really well together. Beg your pardon, that's his first catch. They've gone to Harvey Jones and Hills, and now up the middle to Tarek Ross, who's the best running back, safe to say. Gain of three here uh, in the entire AFL. 375 rushing yards and 19 touchdowns for Ross. I think the biggest number on that, the touchdowns are great, but averaging 4.3 yards per carry in the AFL is insane. You don't really see that too often. This guy's, uh, he's the benchmark. And the, the good thing about him is he's completely taken his game to another level in the pass protection area. Doing a really nice job for Tommy Grady in that offense. Four-time first-team All-Arena player. Jones the motion man. Grady with all day into the end zone. Nearly a one-handed grab. It's broken up, though, by Nick Taylor. I think he was trying to go to the back of the end zone there to Tiger, Tiger Jones. And Joel Hill's coming across, reaches back for it. You see Tiger coming across, but it's a good thing he didn't get it through there because that ball was going to be intercepted on the back line. Cutting it caught across the backside, Manuel Cook would have made a play on that ball. That's a lucky, fortuitous <laughs> pass breakup by Joe Hills. Brings up a third down and seven. From the 12, Jacksonville's opening possession. Hills the motion man. Grady, near side caught. Harvey, a second grab, now loses it. Busted loose, and it's still loose. And finally, recovered by the Sharks. And this, this is where, you know, you see a lot of two-by-one sets right now because this is where you learn. You see it gets stripped out right there by Manuel Cook, who does a nice job. And this team's been all over the turnover bug. you got to jump on the ball. A lot of guys standing around trying to pick it up and run. And Key Ruffins does a nice job picking that up. I thought that was the first lesson <laughs> in Pop Warner football. It's how to fall on the ball, not try to pick it up. So at the end of all that, they gain four. So a fourth and three. Nine for 18 on fourth down this season for the Sharks. Into the end zone, he floats it up and it's picked off by Nick Taylor who brings it out across the five. So the Preds with a huge defensive stop early on in this game. He gets fooled right here. He gets fooled. Taylor with his second pick. And you said it, Tommy Grady with a bad decision, fooled by the Preds secondary. They go back on offense, leading 7-0 in the first. Welcome back. It's strength against strength here. Number one in total offense, number one in rushing offense for the Preds. Meantime, the Sharks third in total D, second in rush defense as we bring in Anthony Heron. It really is, I mean, exactly what the graphic says. You got one really good offense, one really good defense here, Big Ant. And the matchup I'm most paying attention to is most certainly on the edge. We know Joe Sykes spoke to our Cedric Bonner before the game, but Pete, but uh, Jerry Turner coming off the opposite edge, a great pass rusher in his own right, has had double-digit sack seasons in his career. 
Sykes coming off the edge for this Jacksonville defense. Morris gets it out quickly. Bucked by Tompkins, who makes a move out across the 15. That one to Brandon Tompkins. His second catch gains seven. Quick read of the defense. Bernard doing a good job just getting the ball out of his hands, allowing his playmakers to take care of it. How about this shark defense with Sykes? I tell you what, Joe Sykes is on fire. I tell you, he's got some bookends on the other side, as Ant talked about, but his numbers are off the charts. 25 tackles, 16 tackles for a loss, 12 sacks, five forced fumbles, and it goes on and on. <laughs> it's like PlayStation numbers. He's number one in all the key categories. Swung out near side, it's dropped by Kendall Tompkins, who scored the opening touchdown of this game. That's kind of the enigma with Kendall, is he's uh, on the deep, tough balls and the tough plays, he makes every one of those, but the simple little out routes or the hitch routes kind of loses his focus at times. And that can put your offense in a hole when you're dropping easy first down passes. Brings up third down and three for the Orlando Predators. Tell you what, there are few buildings where the atmosphere is better than this one across this league. They're jacked up on third down for the defense. Morris over the top, over the middle, and batted away. Greg Reed, the rookie out of Florida State. You just got to put it out there. The ball needs to land way back in this area here. It's short and behind. And Greg Reed undercuts it, but he just doesn't get enough on it. Nice job of staying involved in the play by Greg Reed, working his way back down and finishing the playoff. And I'm going to... Man, it is loud in this building right now. <laughs> I haven't heard anything like this. These people are going bonkers right now. Fourth down and three for the Preds. Walked it up near side. Bracken's into the crowd. So is the football. It's incomplete. And the Shark defense stands tall. This this is a really tough miss right here. You get the blown coverage, both DBs squat, and he's kind of spinning himself out of bounds. Crowd had something to do with that. This place came to add to it tonight. 6.26 in the first. The Preds on the road leading the Sharks 7-0. Don't miss one-to-one -one Monday night, 6.30 Eastern, as we sit down for an exclusive interview with one of the most legendary college basketball coaches of all time, Duke head coach Mike Krzyzewski, only on CBS Sports Network, the 24-hour home of CBS Sports. Power rankings week number two, San Jose number one. These two teams at fourth and sixth, respectively. With a bullet. I mean, no one's going to catch San Jose, but... Uh or Philly right now, but these two teams were both on the bottom three weeks ago, three, four weeks ago. They were down around the 8-9 spot, and they've kind of jumped up. Both playing at a high level. You see the intensity. It's going to be a great finish. So the Sharks with a stop on defense. They average five stops per game. They've got it at the Orlando 15-yard line. Tommy Grady swings it out, caught. Jerron Harvey down the boards and gets slammed over the wall. Terrence Moore. <laughs> the gain of six, but Harvey paid the price. He really did, and I think if we get a little more accurate throw, he has to stop and turn around for the ball, but Terrence Moore flying over with the big hit. Out of bounds. Moore was voted one of the top 50 players in the Arena Football League over the offseason. It's for plays like that. The sideline to sideline activity from the Jack linebackers. On second down from the nine, the Sharks hand up a Ross. Nothing this time. They're pushed backwards. He loses one. Derek Ross is 250 pounds Excuse in his me? fifth season. <laughs> he scored 32 <laughs> or more touchdowns in each of his first four years in the league. The boss, Derek Ross, he's a little more than 250, yeah. but the guy's feet are phenomenal for a big man. And talk about that. You're down on field level. What's it like to see a big guy like that coming at you, shaking you? You rarely see it in the Arena Football League, a guy with the size to be that additional pass protector in the backfield, but the footwork of a true outdoor tailback. Tiger Jones, motion man, they look for him. Flung it on top, and it's caught. Ten yards to Jones. Here comes a dance. 
See him win on the over route. He's going to come here, shake at the top, and bend around the back. Tommy stays with him. You see the stutter there? Gets ahead of the receiver. And that's a really nice job, a subtle job of his hands, slapping the receiver's hands out of the way, which allows him to get around for the easy score. Julian Roush knocks it through, ties it at seven. Four to play in the first. How about Tiger Jones? with his 23rd touchdown of the year. Spectacular winning Tiger Jones, six. The tires are kicked and the fires are lit. All tied at seven at Seabest Field. The man who just scored the touchdown, Anthony Tiger Jones, joins me here in the Sharks bench area. Your first season in Jacksonville, it seems like you've picked up right where you left off all those years in Philly. Yeah, man, it's a great atmosphere. As you can see, me and Tommy on the same page. Just kind of keep working and, and close this thing out. Now, Jason Jones was normally your dance partner with the Philadelphia Soul. What kind of celebrations can we expect throughout tonight's game? Well, right there, we had to get the big boys in there with a little soul train line. Get them through there, bobbing and weaving. Just stay tuned. <laughs> right, thanks, Tiger. We're looking forward to watching it. Brent? See, I like Cornelius Lewis for a big guy. He was pretty good with his feet there. Tiger always gets the big boys involved with it, which makes it fun. I mean, he and Jason Jones used to have some legendary dances. Brandon Tompkins takes it off the net. The Preds, he fumbles this one. Going to try to make something out of it. Gets hit, breaks two tackles, and falls forward out to the five. So far, what do you think? We get some uh, another dust up. We saw this before kickoff, some extracurricular activity, and, and you're down there, obviously on the field, Big Ant. What are you, uh, what are you seeing from both sides so far? Well, Brent, you certainly get the sense that first place in the division is on the line. We heard Rob Keith in the pregame locker room talking about winning the state of Florida. This South Division, when you include the Tampa Bay Storm, has been as hotly contested in recent years as any division in the Arena Football League. And we see the emergence of teams this year where the play throughout this division only separated by two games, six wins for the top team, four wins for the Tampa Bay Storm at the bottom. It's going to be this way throughout the entire stretch run. I've had the sense for it throughout the game. You mentioned that we've shown the dust up that took place beforehand. And here we've seen it snap after snap, a little bit of extra pushing, shoving. The officials will have to get a After the play, the both teams foul. Dead ball on sportsmanlike conduct. Orlando number 26. Dead ball on sportsmanlike conduct. Jacksonville number 28. First down. 28. Emmanuel Cook for the Preds. And he called 28. He called uh, he called two or 28. Julian Roush is. He might have called 25. He might have called Haggerty. Yeah, you got Haggerty for it. But you can't, you can't allow your emotions to get out, get out of hand. You know, this is an important game. You got to just settle down. The team that does that the best, because the way they're going right now, somebody's going to get booted if it continues. From the five, Morris to the Preds offense, back out there. Over the middle, it's broken up. Intended for Greg Carr. And the defense that time by Terrence Smith, part of this extremely physical secondary of the Sharks. And Terrence Smith gets there a little bit early. Grabs the left arm, gets away with it, but Bernard Morris, so for his last four throws, has missed a couple easy ones. He's got to settle back in and get back to doing the little things that, that made him successful earlier. They got to. Get comfortable with the play calls. Terrence Smith out of South Carolina State, fifth season. They got Xavier Brewer out of Clemson back there. Greg Reed out of Florida State. This one down the far side, jostling for position and car. 
didn't get the flag because Jackson was right there with a good D. Or was it good D? Uh, it said, I'll tell you what, from down here, I'm seeing the throwing lanes not really being open because the edge rusher is not using speed up the field. Both Joe Sykes and Jerry Turner using power collapsing the pocket. But the throwing window, especially with Bernard Moore being 6'5", he can still hit the stack routes on the outside because the Jack linebacker, Alvin Ray Jackson, staying in the box, seemingly playing his running ability. Morris from his own end zone slings it too high in a row three. It'll bring up fourth and ten. Now the ball gets away from him. You're going to see the pressure as Anthony was talking about. Power rush a la what the Arizona Rattlers like to do. He's able to step up there, but you step up, you got to maintain your composure and make an accurate throw. Right now, Bemo is just a little out of sorts. He needs somebody to make a big play for him. Or he needs to use his legs if he can catch Alvin Ray Jackson out of the box. Here comes fourth down. Morris guns it deep, wide open. Brandon Tompkins. 45 yards to silence this crowd. Wow. Fourth down, how do you allow that to happen? Somebody got caught peeking in the backfield. You see him take that corner route, and they were in a cover two there. The soft sky. T. Smith's not deep enough. Mark Lewis makes it 14-7. This thing has gone deathly silent after Brandon Tompkins got loose on a fourth and 10. Fourth and 10, you see the great post corner out. I'm gonna dive it all the way in. Take it right out, BMO hits him on time. Forty-nine seconds remaining in the first. The Preds leading 14-7. The latest news scores and stats. Log on to arenafootball.com. Whether you want to check out special features on the league's brightest stars or watch live games via the ESPN3 video player, arenafootball.com is where it's at. Brandon Tompkins now 63 catches and just grabbed his 14th touchdown, 45 yards on a fourth and ten. So he and Kendall Tompkins, each with long scores, and the Preds lead on the road 14-7. Larachi Jackson with his first opportunity on a live return. Stutter steps, breaks a tackle, and then pushed backwards inside his own five-yard line. And he takes it back just 10 yards this time. Tommy Grady, six of eight, 50 yards, one touchdown, one pick. You surprised with anything so far? Well, I'm surprised with the pick he threw in the red zone, but you know, when I really look into it, not so much surprised, just because it's a new team. Red zone is where everything kind of gets a little mur murked up a little bit. You got to look at uh, Coach Moss up there. He's uh, dealing with some feet issues, um, so he is, Actually being wheeled around in a wheelchair. We saw him before the game, and he's calling calling this game from up in one of the suites. Here's Grady on first down. Near boards wide open. Tiger Jones crossing midfield, spun down at the Preds 23. A gain of 22 should be the final play of the quarter. Got a flag down, though. The stop the clock with 10 seconds. Holding. Offense, number 62. Half a distance to the goal. Replay first down. Ray McNeil, the center, five-year veteran. So take it back even further inside the five. And this is a really great recognition, and too bad the play comes back, but the catch, Orlando on a cloud, soft cloud coverage. Tommy does a nice job reading and, and soft touch over the top to Anthony Jones. And now they restart the clock, and it goes to zeros. End of the first quarter. 
here at Seabest Field in Jacksonville. The first place, Orlando Predators leading 14-7. You're watching Arena Football on CBS Sports Network. Back at Seabest Field where the score is 14-7. Orlando leading Jacksonville. High above the field, Jacksonville starts Arena Bowl Championship coach Les Moss, likely a future Hall of Famer. Hasn't been able to be down here at field level near his team like I am right now because of a nerve issue. Brent Silver, you referenced it earlier in the broadcast tonight. Actually was outside, hot on the concrete in Jacksonville to get heated down here in Florida. And his feet got burned. And so in recent weeks, it sounds like it's going to take a couple more weeks where he's actually been wheeling around the practice field in a golf cart. And during games, he's been coaching from up on high, using the headset to communicate with his assistant coaches. He told us a funny story about when he coached with Jay Gruden in the Orlando Predators years ago. He hated the headsets. He's got to use it more now than ever, though. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony, as we start the second. On first and 12 now after a penalty to close out the first quarter. It's dropped at the far boards by Tiger Jones. Pretty good start for Jacksonville quarterback Tommy Grady. He's number three in the league in passing yardage and third in touchdown throws as well. Second down. This is his fourth team of his young career, third in as many years in the last three years, and, and all teams have been contenders. You know, he set the arena record for touchdown passes just three short years ago. This guy is very talented, and with the right group, he is definitely an arena bowl champion type quarterback. And a first down pickup here as he connects with Tiger Jones out to the 17. You said it's interesting when you think about the career that Tommy Grady has put together so far. I mean, that 2012 season, there weren't just arena football records he set with nearly 6,000 passing yards, over 140 touchdowns in the regular season. Professional football records that Tommy Grady had that year in recent seasons, last season with the Pittsburgh Power, this season with the Jacksonville Sharks. He's had a bit of a journeyman feel to him the last couple of years, but when you think about where he ranks amongst AFL quarterbacks, that championship is what continues to separate him from the Nick Davilas of the world. Absolutely. Tommy Grady on first down. Steps up, slings it, broken up and intercepted. Picked off the Predators, get it back. Thanks to Rod Isaac out of Middle Tennessee State. This is a big time hit. You're going to see him. This is a really good job by Tommy to step up in the pocket. He steps up, makes the throw. An ill-advised throw at that. Isaac gets the turnover off the padded ball by Cook. Preds back on offense. Tommy Grady, the Sharks quarterback, just threw his second interception of this first half. Prior to this game, in the last four games combined, just one interception to go with 20 touchdowns. So a bit surprising for Grady, and he's down 14-7 here at home. His team on a four-game winning streak. They started the year 0-4. They've won five of six since. And they begin the night second place. In the South Division of the American Conference behind this Predators team, the Preds lead him by one game. Crook out, caught, cross midfield, where he's pushed out of bounds. It's Kendall Tompkins with a cane of eight. That's how you get your guys settled down. And coming off that last touchdown, before the last long touchdown by Orlando, it was looking pretty scary for their offense. They were out of sorts. And then a blown coverage allowed them to get their composure back. Put some points on the board. They get to the turnover. Now they go back to work. Trying to reestablish dominance in this game. Second down and two. Brandon Tompkins, the motion man. Hand off. And a nice push up front. Michael Simons. He's got 107 rushing yards and eight touchdowns to the ground this season. And he gains three there to move the sticks. As well as nine receptions for 124 yards. A capable back, a guy that can really do something. You get you usually get those 300 pounders back there that are true offensive linemen. You're not looking to hand the ball to them. Simons is a different kind of case. Really good athlete. Plays with physicality. Simons had four touchdowns last week. Had two touchdowns in the first meeting this year between these two teams. 
On first down, Morris for the end zone. Touchdown, Brandon Tompkins. Penalty marker down back in the backfield, though. Touchdown. Tell you what, Jacksonville's secondary better get their stuff together because they've given up some big plays. You get a hold on the offensive line. We didn't see it early, but we'll get a look. I think it's going to go against Earl Latson on, on turn. No, right there in the middle, Simons. Right there are circles. Right where the circle was in the middle. Pull Jerry Turner down. Another Grizzly vet that understands how to get pressure on the QB. On first and 20, come over the middle, Brandon Tompkins. First down to the 20 yard line of the Sharks, a gain of a dozen. Rache Jackson putting the hammer down. Much more manageable second down. There's Jackson. Kind of shocking. He didn't have a team for the first four weeks of this season. Fine return man, physical guy in the secondary. Second down, Morris, end zone. Broken up. You got to throw the ball out in front. He didn't get the shoulder squared and tracked. And Big Ant, you had a Big Ant, you had a great view of this throw. What lane was that for you? Was that the wrong too far inside or out in front? Where did it need to be there? Well, what stands out to me is Bernard Morris is getting back into some of the older habits that you've referenced previously this season on CBS Sports Network. Falling away from his throws when he doesn't really have to, you get the sense that pass rush that's been starting to get home more and more from Jacksonville, having an effect on his platform in the pocket, not staying tall, delivering the football with some accuracy and strength from his platform. On third and eight, Morris rifles it, caught, first down inside the 10. It's Kendall Tompkins. And said one of the things that's interesting to me when you compare these two offenses, Bernard Morris has the advent of his offensive coordinator, Cy Burley, being here with him because Morris doesn't call his own plays. You've been through both versions of that as a quarterback, said you called your own plays for a number of years. You've also had coaches who called them for you. Describe the difference. I think the difference is you're you're more in tune. You've got to be tapped into what's going on on a daily basis. Uh, you're, you're working with the game plan as just a player, but as a play caller, you have you have to be alert and aware of what's going in week in and week out. Your film study's got to improve. You're responsible for a lot more because not only do you need to know, but you you've also got to get everybody else on the same page with you as you create those great habits to try to go get some victories. Timeout, Orlando. Fourteen seven, nine fifty nine before halftime. Be sure to check out arenafootball.com for the latest news and info on the Arena Football League. While you're there, be sure to shop the AFL Team Fan Shop for the latest team gear. Check out arenafootball.com tonight. It's Pirates and Princesses night here at Seabest Field, a raucous environment. The Jacksonville Sharks, who completely turned around their season after an 0 4 start. If the playoffs began today, they would be in. They trail these Orlando Predators by one game in the South Division. On first and goal, Bernard Morris. All day, end zone, nearly picked off. Nearly picked off by Alvin Ray Jackson. Who, who Alvin Ray Jackson got away with a, a little bit of getting out of the box a little early. You can go six yard depth. Ball's on the seven yard line. You're gonna watch him turn and run. He's already running in the end zone before the ball was even thrown. He got away with one, but sometimes you gotta take those chances and make those plays. I tell you, if that ball is thrown up, car six foot six, throw that ball up where he has to go up to the highest point. You got a shot. Second down rollout. Morris wants to run. Breaks one tackle down the boards. And a solid pickup to make something out of nothing, a gain of three. I was wondering, 
when we were going to get to the point where they started to call some run plays for Bernard Morris down here in the red zone. These rounded end zones, as you know, guys, it makes it such tough duty on the wide receiver, especially now here inside the five. The route tree is just so condensed. It really is, Big Ann. It makes it tough for the timing routes. You got to almost run everything in the middle of the field as a receiver, not using those back corners because there's no space. And I always, as a quarterback, hated end zones like this. You lose three, four yards back there in some spots. The fake to Brackens. Again, Morris steps up, runs, and gets hammered at the five. It's a coverage sack for the Sharks. Stop around the five-yard line. I mean, there's just nowhere to throw it. You talked about the tight space of those rounded end zones. And the Sharks, D, you said they better get it figured out in the secondary. They have about since the time you said that. Well, they didn't give up the big play, and that's, you work, make them work down here and get into the red zone where you can use that end zone as Mark Lewis comes in to attempt the field goal. 19 yards out, Lewis bangs it in. 19-yarder for Lewis. If it stands, he's now three of five on the season. His long on the season was 19, which is exactly the distance he just knocked it through from. ready for play at 20 seconds on the play clock. Therefore, the play does not count. There is no foul on the play. Please reset the play clock to 25 seconds. Replay the kick. So replay the kick, and Lewis will have to do it again. He's two of four on the season. He'll try it again from 19 yards out. Does it again. Midpoint of the second quarter, and it's now 17 7 Orlando. Well, Rob Keefe has got to be pleased with what he's seen in the Preds so far tonight. We chatted with him early this morning, at least it was early by my standards, and he was like he is on a Saturday night. Rob Keefe, definitely one fired up individual. Believe in the man next year and beat the man across from me. Whatever it takes for 60 minutes and then some, if we gotta do what we gotta do to win this football game. Put on the show, put on the show, have a day, put on the show. That's a good shot to end on. It's great back paddle right there. Yeah. Still got the skills. Absolutely. He could have broken on that ball yeah, if it was well, still Well, he in broke the air. on one of my passes <laughs> back, back when he was with New Jersey and intercepted me for a touchdown. He, he's a little oh. bit, he reminds me a little bit, I don't know about you, but of John Gruden, the former NFL head coach who was known for, uh, for his facial expressions and fire, a head coach for the Oakland Raiders, Tampa Bay Bucks, and of course in his first season of the Bucks, he won a Super Bowl. Definitely some similarities. Oh, I watch the Gruden camps all the time. It's awesome watching the QBs go through the Gruden camps, but Rob Keefe is on a different level. You, you, you would want to call him a five-hour energy man, but it's more like a 15-hour energy yes. man because he is non-stop. When he walks in the room, it's instant caffeine. He woke me up. Mark Lewis sends it away. Short one. Miss hit that one. It'll be taken by Larachi Jackson. Crosses the 10, breaks a tackle, and now pushes his way forward out near the 15. Nice return by Jackson. To get 14. Two interceptions so far thrown by Tommy Grady, the Sharks quarterback. Yeah, I really got a, you know, bad decisions. Basically, the first one on the corner route, you're going to see him wait and gets baited by the outside corner. Taylor's able to come in and make the pick, and the second one, he steps up, eludes the rush. He could have fallen down for about five yards, decides to try to throw it. Ball's a little behind, goes off Joe Hills, and Rod Isaacs makes the pick. 7 of 11 for 63 yards, one touchdown, two interceptions. He's not going to want to talk to me anymore, man. No. He, he thrown two picks tonight? It's absolutely going through his mind right now. <laughs> Motion man is Harvey. 
Grady, deep, got a man under through him. Penalty marker out. Grady gets bailed out that time. Well, sometimes that's that's the best thing that can happen if it's not going to be completed. Pass interference. Defense number 21. 10-yard penalty. Automatic first down. Tiger Jones. Tiger Jones really showing showing his smarts here because a lot of guys would continue to run. He turns and Grady has to fall away. There was pressure up inside, but he turns and tries to make a play, forces the defensive back to run through him. You see right there as he turns to try to make a play on the ball. That's a really heads up play by Tiger Jones. But Grady was under duress. That pocket was crumbling in front of him as he was trying to step into that throw. Clock winds under seven to play in the second. Grady slings one near boards and not a good throw intended for Hills. Some frustration shown from Tommy Grady there. Looks like he was trying to go with the back shoulder. Joe Hills continued to run up the boards. Saw Tommy Grady clapping his hands a bit. I believe they're going hitch routes, trying to get a completion. Got Hills and Harvey out there. Tiger Jones in high motion. And Grady sacked. Back at the 20 yard line. A loss of five. So there's a cloud coverage. Terrence Moore goes over and covers the boundary receiver where Grady wants to go. And Harvey just kind of sits behind him. Doesn't work his way around the jack. You can get a good view of it right there. He's standing right behind the jack. Got to figure out a way to work together and work around that jack linebacker to get open for your quarterback. Toby Jacks in the sack. Third and 14. Jones again, the motion man. Grady fires it, caught by Jones. First down inside the 15. A gain of 14. He let this baby rip right here, ain't eh? You saw him, a good platform, solid. Watch him step into this throw on the deep smash route. It's just a post, and he stops on it, but watch him step into it. Oh, you got, oh that's great. And arm strength, not a necessary ingredient to be an AFL quarterback. There's few guys who had the outdoor arm strength like you did, said Tommy Grady, definitely one of the QBs in the AFL that can sling it. From the 15, swing it out to Harvey, and he gets popped after gaining five. <laughs> They're hitting out here, guys. <laughs> I'll yeah. tell you what, they are hitting. There's some lumber being laid. Usually, Big Ant, you don't see that from the secondary, but both of these secondaries willing to stick their nose in there. As you see, Emmanuel Cook and Taylor Bringing it. Fred's saying our secondary is pretty physical as well. Second and five, 424 before halftime. Tiger Jones gets some space and down near the five. Gain of five, did he get the first? Not quite. Third and a short one. Uh, right rocket, X back. Twenty-two base. Either they're gonna run the ball here. It's Twenty-two base. Look for the boss to get in the action here. Number thirty-nine. Derek Ross. Look at him rumble for the first down and almost to the goal line. Yeah, I, I tell you what. Calvin Fance has a chance to bring him down. Ex-teammates in Philadelphia, and he runs right through him and Terrence Moore. This shows you why he's so tough to bring down the great footwork. Here it comes again, a nice dive play. You're gonna see Derek Ross try to pound it in, but you've gotta expect that D-line to pinch. First and Cole Ross, he got there, touchdown.
talked about the D-line coming inside. Ross has good enough feet to bounce it. And again, doing his old teammate, teammate Ducky there at the goal line, Calvin Vance. Doing his good feet to stop. Get outside quick enough to still get it in. I mean, that's some power. And Roush as it blocks. Calls on it back at the 18. Austin Brown. Well, Derek Ross just scored his 20th touchdown of the season at 17-13. 219 in the second. The Preds lead the Sharks 17-13. National Pro Fast Pitch Action returns to CBS Sports Network as the defending champion, USSSA Pride, Take the time against the Dallas Charge, live from McKinney, Texas, Monday at 7 Eastern, right here on the 24-hour home of CBS Sports. Low-scoring game so far here tonight, 17-14, deep in this first half. 17-13, I should say, after the blocked extra point. I feel like we've seen good offense, though, as well. You know, I know it's low-scoring, but we've seen some good offensive plays. We've seen a turnover in the red zone, turnover on downs by Orlando in the red zone. So both teams' defense is stepping up to the occasion. Onside kick, still loose, and it's Predators football. Not a bad idea there, huh? The flag down late. Looks like someone's off sides. You just hate that as a coach. Absolutely. That's a, the one time they call that because, you know, they'll give you leniency on the kickoff. Offside. Offside. Kicking team number 40. Penalties declined. Ball was recovered by Orlando. First down. You know, Big Ant, they'll give you some, some, some leeway on the kickoff, but if it's an onside, you're getting rung up for being offside <laughs> every single time. So the positive for Orlando, they get it at the 15 of the Sharks. More is 7 of 15 for 122. Pretty good numbers, and he went through a stretch where he wasn't, wasn't able to hit the side of a barn for a minute. <laughs> He's got the big receivers in Brackens and Carr. Morris slings it. And wow. a catch by Brackens, one-handed, and a 15-yard touchdown strike. This is a really, really tough route to run, especially for a big, long guy like Boogie. I mean, watch this corner route, and the ball's out. And watch the one-hand snap. Give me that. I mean, that is a great job. Good coverage, but when you got that kind of size like Larry Brackens, it doesn't matter. Coverage is all over it, and he just reaches out and snatches it in. Tenth touchdown reception for Brackens. Lewis off the iron, no good. So back-to-back -back failed extra point attempts. One for either side makes it 23-13 with a minute 10. Big Ant, I know you've been around. You've covered Larry Brackens for a long time. Have you seen him move this quickly, getting in and on cuts? I haven't for a while. Well, and the great thing about it is that he's still playing outstanding on special teams as well. I mean, maybe the oldest player, between he and Mark Lewis, the oldest real football guy on the team is Larry Brackens, but he's still first down there covering kicks, and he's got the frame in the red zone, but the spacing and the understanding of the spacing that he's working with is what really separates him from a lot of other receivers who maybe have that big frame. I think that's the next level of the play for Greg Carr. You're looking at him as a red zone target. He's still a young player that doesn't have that Larry Bracken's level of understanding of working the space in the red zone quite yet. It's a great point. You get to watch that guy on film day in and day out and kind of get an understanding. It speeds up the lear learning curve. Bernard Morris now with three touchdown throws to give him 24 on the season. And again, this is just his fifth start of the season. Now, this is a guy that played in three consecutive conference championship games, really understands and got hot early in this game. You see the two long throws and had it going. Brandon Tompkins with the nasty plunge at the finish. And right there, just standing in the pocket, surveying, finding his big man down in the paint. 
as it would be Larry Brackens, or excuse me, Bernard Morris just getting back comfortable after missing a few throws. Got his thing going. They're going to have a decision to make in about three or four weeks when Randy Hippert comes back. An onside kick by the Preds. This one beautifully done. Did they get there? No. That's about as good as you can do That's it a from, kick. from Mark Lewis's vantage point. Great kick, and I, and I believe it was Nick Taylor ran, runs by it. He doesn't see it and runs right by it, or Calvin Vance. And then he gets drilled into the boards. Ouch. By Scooter Perry. The idea, you know, for fans that don't watch a lot of arena football, the onside kick at this point of the half. So, five yard penalties tacked on to the end of the run. First down. Two reasons you would do it. You would want to do it to gain possessions. You want to try and get extra possessions or finish the half with the ball. If you're Orlando right now, you don't want to give up a score. And if you're Jacksonville, you want to hold the ball as long as possible and try to force Orlando to use all their timeouts. But it's just a, you know, depends on who gets it last. I mean, it makes a big difference, and these guys know what they're doing. We'll be back for the finish. You got it. One minute warning in this first half. One minute warning, 23 13. Before the break, we were talking upstairs here about. Strategy inside the final minute. How about your thoughts on it, Anthony, as we look at what's coming up at the half of the plays of the year, the news and notes, and the scores as well? Well, for me, if I were the Jacksonville Sharks, my thought process would be score quickly, have the opportunity to try and have as much time on the, on the clock as possible closing out this half. So now, if you just got maybe 50 seconds left and you score a touchdown at this point, still an opportunity to kick an onside kick hoping that you can steal a possession that you'll need here before the end of the first half. There you go, 60 seconds and the ball to 10 after a missed opportunity for the Preds on an onside kick. Brady under center. Got Harvey in motion. Brady, end zone, diving play, and incomplete. A good effort by Tiger Jones to lay out. He goes to Tiger Jones, but he comes off of Jerron Harvey a little bit early. Mm. That is so near a great catch. Jerron Harvey ran a, a corner, corner over route and was wide open, but he had chosen another good target to go to and Tiger Jones. Jones with five catches and a score so far. Grady floats it up and nearly picked off, but incomplete. And Grady narrowly avoiding throwing his third pick of this first he, half. He just doesn't look like he has the timing with Jerron Harvey. I don't know what you see and down there, but it does look like he has the timing with Harvey. I'm seeing the officials allowing both secondaries from each team, Orlando and Jacksonville, the opportunity to get handsy with receivers down here in the red zone. I love the fact they're letting it go. And Rob Keefe knew that his rookie defensive back, Nick Taylor, had an opportunity at his second INT of this first half, just narrowly missed. Brings up a third and goal from the 10. Grady escapes. Grady fires it. Incomplete. Trying to go low on those far boards to Tiger Jones. Tough coverage. Physical in the secondary. See Harvey trying to get over back out to the corner. That's just, I mean, look at that. It's locked up, locked up, locked up over on the other side. Nowhere to go with the ball. So we're seeing a quick personnel change from Orlando. Brandon Tompkins running into the lineup. In case this field goal is missed, he'll have an opportunity to return it. 25 yarder. Julian Roush. And Roush. Off the net, missed it wide right. It's a live ball for the Preds. Flag down in the end zone. It's Brandon Tompkins. Crosses the five. Brandon reverses field and finally gets dragged down. It's going to be kick catch interference inside the five. See what the call is here. 
to catching interference. Kicking team, number 56. Five-yard penalty added to the end of the run. First down, Orlando. So Brandon Tompkins getting a little something done on that missed field goal by Roush. Anytime you're kicking, you've got to stay outside of there. Allow your guy, you got to wait at the five-yard line, can't get inside. And JT, Jerry Turner, just inside of that, about a yard, but they're going to make that call every time. So football out just shy of the nine. 32 seconds to play, and the clock stops as it normally would in the outdoor game inside the final minute of each half. Caught for a first down and reaching for the wall to stop the clock is Tompkins. There's a play you don't see all the time, but it's another way to get the clock stopped. As soon as he makes his catch on the bench route, well-thrown ball outside. Watch DT stick his hands over with the ball. And that signifies to the officials that he's given himself up on the play and the clock will be stopped. After the 23, a pickup of 14 for Brandon Tompkins. Kendall Tompkins in motion. Morris fires behind his man, it's picked off. And Larachi Jackson returns it back to his own 19 after getting his second pick of the year. Great play by Larache, who's talked about being on the streets for five weeks, nowhere to play. This guy just plays tough, physical, and you see him laying out with the great hands. Ball clearly behind Bernard or Brandon Tompkins. And then right there, as a quarterback, you get your head on a swivel. Better watch it. You better watch it. You got to get your head on a swivel. Jerry Turner taking it easy. He didn't really do anything to him. <laughs> Could have lit him up. <laughs> So 21 seconds, Sharks get it back. You and I saw Jackson at the season opener. He was in Vegas Absolutely. watching the games. A fan, I remember, I was kind of scratching my head. I think we both were like, why, why is this guy not in uniform somewhere? I, I don't know, but for him, this is such a great move. It's a place he started his career here in Jacksonville. He loves the city, and they love him back. I mean, he is one of those tenacious, emotional, physical players that gets after it on each and every play. Well, we got a challenge flag coming out late, right before the snap. Review. So they want to review that last one. And here in the final minute of each half. Moving on the field is an interception by the defense. Challenge flag cannot come from the coach themselves. Supervisor of officials here on location, Buddy Ward, throws the officials challenge flag out. It's the arena football call to the booth. So they will take a look and visit, put on the headset and visit with the producer, Ryan Galvin, in our truck. Hey, Ryan. Okay, we're ready, whenever you are. All right, so what we want to see is if the ball hit the ground before the defender got possession of it. Looks like his hands were under, looks like his hands were under it there. Okay, let's do it a little slow. Okay, so can we go frame by frame on that one, please? Okay, give me that, that's fine. Okay, let's see. Reaches him. Okay. This looks like the best one we have. He's got his hands on it, he's got control. Okay. That one's inconclusive. Let's go back to the one right before that, if we could. Thank you. And let's just slow it down a little, frame by frame. Okay, keep going. It, to me, that's inconclusive. So the ruling on the field is going to stand. The ruling on the field will stand. Thank you, Ryan. Well, there you go. It's an interception, a beautiful diving pick by Larachi Jackson. You agree with that? Yeah, it's inconclusive. And, I, and from what it looked like, he controlled it, rolled his. First down, 
and rolled his body. And the ball can hit the ground if you're in control of it and your hands are around it. That's what it looked like to me. Anthony, what'd you see? Well, in live action from behind the ball, it appeared to me that there was control of the football on the diving grass. I think it may have touched the ground. I didn't have the advent of the replay. I wasn't near a monitor like you guys, but in live action, it looked like even though the ball touched the ground, Jackson controlled it with both hands. That, that's exactly what I thought, Big Ant. 21 seconds to play. 23-13 game. Grady slings it far side. A pickup of nine yards for Joe Hills. I'll tell you, that's a really missed opportunity there for Orlando going into the half, knowing that Jacksonville will get the ball coming out. Big time missed opportunity. They could have really, I don't want to say stepped on the throats because this is a long game, but really done a lot to make it tough for Jacksonville to get back in it. It's one of those moments that Jacksonville really needs to take advantage of because it could have been very deflating to not have that two for one opportunity they had with the ball in a minute to go. Jones in motion on second down and they blow it dead. Ball start. Offense number 72. Five yard penalty. Second down. And it's Cornelius Lewis. 17 seconds on this first half clock. Orlando leading by 10. The Predators lead the South Division in the American Conference at six and four. The Sharks in second place at five and five. The Preds have won three straight, the Sharks four in a row. Not on the line here tonight in Jacksonville. Grady with all day. Near side, Hills is open. And Hills down near the 15 on a first down pickup. So you watch Joe Hills go to work. He's, he's so business like. Doesn't do a whole lot of talking, but the guy just makes plays. A 16 yard pickup there. And still 11 seconds to play with here. The football at the 16. Jones again in motion. Tommy Grady fires it, caught. Tiger Jones down to the two, and a quick timeout with five seconds. Again, they go back to the deep smash route. They go back to the deep smash route, they run Tiger, he sells a post, steps on the brakes, and comes out of it, and again, Big Tommy Gray, he steps on the gas and puts the no, number one on him. Watch this route, he's gonna come down and step out and come right back out of it. Look at that throw, perfect throw, great hands catch. Another big hit from the secondary of Orlando, but a great catch and Jacksonville's got something going, especially when you've got Mr. Ross in the backfield. This should be plenty of time, plenty of time no. This should be enough time right? to run a play. Let's go X right and he Still, have time remaining. Still two timeouts uh, remaining for the Sharks. Seven seconds is where you're more in the comfort zone knowing for sure. Five seconds remaining. We've seen crazy things happen where someone gets tackled in bounds. They still have two timeouts as well. This time Hills in motion. They look to Hills. Grady lofts it up. Hills! Did he come down with it over the wall? He says he did. Flag down, and the officials say incomplete. I saw him on his back down there, holding the ball up, holding the ball up, and Nick Taylor runs over and knocks it out. The result of the play is an incomplete pass. Illegal defense. Defense, Mac out of the box. Half the distance to the goal. Automatic first down. So, no touchdown, zeros on the clock. It's a defensive penalty. So they're gonna get one final one crack at it. That was almost a remarkable play. A lot going on there. You yeah, got the penalty, the you know, near awesome catch, plus the time running out. It looks like he, he had it, but watch when he goes to stick it up there. <laughs> I mean, it looked like he had it there. They should, they're, they're telling coach, and here comes the challenge flag. I think we're gonna have a touchdown. I, I, he, is under review. Yeah, 
It's once again a call to the booth. This is going to be awfully interesting again. It's zeros on the clock. Not definitive. Not definitive. That's the only problem. It's not definitive. One other thing, it was a defensive penalty, so right. either way, they're going to get another they're play. Get another okay, play Ryan. Thank you. All right, so what we want to do is see if he actually maintains control all the way to the ground, even if it's behind the wall. So, okay. All right, we're not even sure he possesses it there. So, we need a better angle. Let's see this one. Okay. Here comes the ball. Let's see what we've got. And he has it, but we can't tell if he had control all the way through. Is that, is, is, those are the only angles? Okay. The ruling on the field is going to stand because we don't have conclusive evidence that he wow. controlled the ball all the way through. Thank you. In any case, remarkable work by our camera crew, but that obviously is the right call based it, it on is. the looks. It is, and based on what the rule says, you, it's not definitive. So, after review, the ruling on the field stands. Incomplete pass. So one more play, because there was the defensive penalty. Yeah, and you got to give Nick Taylor credit for the heads up play, because if he doesn't slap that ball out of there, and he's sitting there holding it up in front of the officials, then the play, then the call on the field is touchdown. Could be a touchdown. Could Correct. be, yeah. And guys, unless wow. I'm mistaken, it could still be more than one play because with the defensive penalty here in the final minute, they should have the option to add the full five seconds back onto the clock. It's the old duck plank rule. You mean tackle him? <laughs> That's the old tackle him, don't let him score. <laughs> Good call, Anthony. So five seconds go on the clock. It's sort of back to square one. Yeah. Except the yard is a bit it, it feels like it's still. A lot <laughs> happened, and now we're in the same position. Yeah. Ten minutes later in the evening. <laughs> and now Jacksonville calls a timeout. They still now have one left after this. Holy smokes. For, for, for nothing, I guess technically nothing happening. That's exactly right. A ton just happened. And said, I mean, one of the plays that they like to run throughout the season down here is what essentially works as a swing pass to Tiger Jones. But that's one of those plays where you do take the risk of him being tackled in bounds. So if they're on the college hash, on the outside hash mark here. So maybe Tiger Jones would have an opportunity to turn the corner. But if he doesn't score, the risk you're taking is can you call the timeout quickly enough? Very scary situation to make that call. I go with some kind of trips route and, and try to find lanes and holes with maybe smash route or an over or a stutter go across the back of the end zone with Tiger Jones, who has tremendous feet. And if it's not there, come down to one of your big fellas. But two by one, it's just too easy for Orlando to stack five across the back of the end zone, basically, with those short corners and make it tough windows for you. So first and goal. Ball is at the two and a half, five seconds. And they blow it dead. Timeout, Preds. Timeout, Orlando. Second charge, timeout of the half. No surprise that this has been a tight, hotly contested first half. So these two teams played early on in the season back on April the 3rd. Here in Jacksonville as well, the Orlando Predators, Jacksonville Sharks, Sharks led by the combo of Tommy Grady and Tiger Jones. They connected on five touchdowns, but the Predators won the game on the might of their seven rushing touchdowns. They beat the Sharks 55-54. Five of those but from Bernard Morris, who we haven't seen use his legs much tonight. Stick around, I'm sure it's coming in the second half. Jacksonville leads the all-time series 8-6. Sharks with five seconds. Each team has called successive timeouts. And here we go. Great looking for Hills. He got knocked down, no call. Emmanuel Cook knocked him down. Bring up second goal with three seconds. And that's why it's so dangerous to backpedal out of a route. 
He gets shoved and gets a little off balance. You're going to see him get pushed. They get exactly what they want. They've got man coverage right here. Man coverage right there and right there. What a strong jam right there. I'll tell you, this secondary, Emmanuel Cook, real physical on that play. That was a big time play. We've seen the same thing out of Nick Taylor. You've mentioned him a few times. Late substitution for the Preds. Brandon Tompkins again hustling onto the field for the potential return. And there's the penalty call. He didn't get there as Roush on the field goal attempt, but they blew it dead. Okay, Before there's... the snap, timeout, Orlando. Third charge, pardon. timeout of the half. Please put three seconds on the game clock. Three Thank seconds. You. Pardon there, it was a timeout. Final timeout called by the Predators. I have no problem with that call there, Big Ant. You know, player running on late, you know you want to get a great push and be in control. Rob Keefe, understanding the situation, calling a timeout, allowing his guys to get settled in for this last play. And I think when you're talking about calls here, like the timeout from Orlando, I think the field goal attempt here by Les Moss just shows how much his team is struggling in the red zone where they're not thinking touchdown here. Roush is five for 10 on the year. 18 yard attempt, Julian Roush, and he knocks it through. And that's how the first half ends. With a field goal by Roush, he's now six of 11 on the season, and it's 23-16 at the break. The Orlando Predators coming in six and four, leaders of the South Division, Jacksonville five and five, and we head down to Anthony. With Coach Rob Keefe, Coach, your defense throughout that first half, I mean, the late field goal given up there, but it looked like you were giving fits to that Jacksonville offense. How were they so effective? Yeah, they're a good team, so we put in the work, we put in the effort and energy to make sure that we prepare correctly. I mean, the motto is respect all, fear none. We respect them so much, we're going to come out here prepared. But what I'd like you to review right now is that was the jack that they thought was out of the box. They thought it was the Mac. The jack can go sideline to side end. The last play, the tight end was to the field. So if you can review that for me. But regardless, we gave up three at the end there. But the guys are playing really hard. Jacksonville gets the ball back in the half, so we're going to have to come out here with another stop. The intensity throughout this first half was evident on the field. Any concern at all about your players allowing that to take over? No, not at all. Our players, we need to come in here in a hostile environment. we got to play intense. You know, Jacksonville thinks they're a bunch of bullies. We're not going to be bullied. We're not going to be punks. What are you doing uh, with anything? If a bully's going to bully you, you bully a bully right back, and that's what we're doing. Appreciate it, Coach. Good luck in the second half. <laughs> we saw a lot of bullies on both sides of that first half. Entertaining here in Jacksonville. 23-16 at the break. You're watching Arena Football on CBS Sports Network. Our halftime begins next. Twenty-three sixteen, the AFL on CBS Sports Network, a jam-packed house here at Seabest Field. Moments ago, <laughs> inside the locker rooms of both teams. We're walk out of here with victory, y'all. That's exactly. We're gonna walk out of here with victory, y'all. With me? That's exactly what we're gonna do. But right now, you gotta play smart football. They have four penalties. We have three. We're playing smart football. Don't back yourself up. Get yourself in a bad situation. Get ready to be clutch. Y'all ready to be clutch? Sir. Clutch city, baby. Clutch city. All right, break this thing up. Hey, we're out at the four minute mark. Three and a half minute mark. We gotta hurry. We gotta hurry. That's not us. Let's go out there. Every single time we gotta put the ball in the end zone. This half. Every single time we gotta put the ball in the end zone. It starts right here, right now. Let's go, man. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Les Moss and Rob Keefe as we get set for the start of the third quarter in a 23-16 game. A lot of importance around this game in the South Division of the American Conference. The Preds one game clear of the Sharks. Both would be in the playoffs as they began tonight. The Predators perfect in the division. The Sharks looking for their first win inside the division. They'd love to get it here tonight. They'll have to come from behind here in this second half. Comparison of the two quarterbacks with Morris, Tommy Grady as well. Well, Morris doing a little better job. It's taking care of the ball. But you know, you look over at Tommy Grady, a couple tough luck turnovers as they're trying to march down late in the half, marching down into the end zone. Those are the turnovers you cannot have down in the red zone. And when you're trying to close things out, you got to really be prudent with the football. Uh, big numbers for both. They're doing a good job, but the turnovers will bite you. You got to stay away from those. Got to give both these defenses credit. Man. They've stepped up. 
And I like, and Big Ant made the point you as well, that, that the physicality and secondary, the officials may be letting some things go that they don't but, always do, but it's been consistent. It has, and I don't mind that. I'm a guy, if you're going to call it one way or let it go, my guys have to step their game up to that level and, and play through that kind of stuff and not look for a flag, not stop play, but play through and try to find a, find a play. Sharks close the first half with possession. They get a field goal. They begin the third quarter with possession as well as Mark Lewis sends it away to Marachi Jackson from one yard deep. Jackson across the 10. Jackson out to midfield, still on his feet, and down to the 20 yard line. Ball comes free late. The Sharks able to get it with phenomenal field position on their first possession of the second half. A 30 yard return, Grady back in the field in first half stats. He showed you what the two quarterbacks did. As we take a look at the team stats and 156 total yards for the Predators, Jacksonville with 123. So Orlando the advantage there, the advantage on the scoreboard, but the Sharks can tie it right out of the gates here. Ocean man is Jerron Harvey. He gets the catch inside the 15, spins down to the nine, and a nice pickup and a first down of 11 for Jerron Harvey. Offensively, what do the Sharks need to do in this second half? They need to punch it in when they get an opportunity to. They've had great field position, gotten into the red zone, but have been turned away by this stingy Orlando defense. They've got to get off of press, get off of the physicality of that defense in the secondary and make plays. The receivers are responsible. They got to get it done. They go for Hills and Tommy Grady overshot him. Penalty marker down. Taylor got tangled up with him. You see him grab Hills around the waist. Really didn't need to. And Interference. Defense number 26. Half the distance of the goal. Automatic first down. Thank your pardon. It was Emmanuel Cook. We talked about he and Taylor and how physical they've been the entire game. Well, he comes downhill and, and just tries to make a play, but grabs a hit of Joe Hills, who was running the corner route. So half the distance, first and goal inside the five. Opening possession, third quarter. Hills the motion man. Handoff. Derek Ross. Pushing his way down to the one. That's big time Larry Zonka style right there. <laughs> Old school. Shaq Williams and Terrence Moore just going for a ride, trying to get him down. Tell you, Cornelius Lewis had Jeremy Gethers seven yards deep in the end zone on that play. Getting off the ball with some aggression. Ross with one touchdown already and make it two. The Florida official says touchdown and that'll stand second of the night for Ross. Way too early to challenge but a really nice hit there. And it looked like the knee touched down on the boss, Derek Ross, before he crossed. He had 61 yards and three scores last week. This is second touchdown tonight. Watch fans hit him right there. The knee comes down and then he falls forward. Knees down and then he falls over the goal line. Can't tell where the football was. In any case, it stands, but this one knocked up the iron wide right from the foot of Julian Rausch. So unable to tie the game. It's 23-22 early third. Crispy M&M's are back. What are you doing? You said to tell our fans crispy M&M's are back. Not those fans. Did you mean this fan? No. What about that one? Nice. There's a fan in the break room. Oh, in so the good. Room. They're oh, back. Go. Meat sticks? Yes! These sticks? No! Yes! No! Yes! No! Yes! Yeah! 
The action has tightened up here at Seabest Field as the AFL's all-time leading rusher gets his team within one point. Derek Ross, your first season with the Jacksonville Sharks. How would you describe what your role is within this offense? Block first. I'm going to block first. You know what I'm saying? I got to get Tommy Grady the ball out, let him get the ball out so we can score. And then I just come on the second end and do my thing. But first, I got to block. Well, I'm sure a lot of the quarterbacks around the league love hearing you say something like that. But I've got to show this helmet here because all the scuffs over it. Is this a part of your role that you're talking about with yes, that sir, blocking block. mentality? I block. I block. I'm going to block so Tommy can get throw, throw them touchdowns, man. <laughs> How's the matchup gone so far against that Orlando defense for you? Oh, yeah, it's going good. I mean, I just, just got my second touchdown. I'm trying to get by two or three more. So we're just trying to see how it goes. We're trying to win a ball game. All right, back to you, Brent. He's saying all the right things, huh? <laughs> Man, that, that's a football player, huh? I'll tell you what, he's, he really changes the way you can play defense. If you've got a big offensive lineman back there, you don't have to worry about a guy that's not athletic. You don't have to worry about the double releases and the fullback runs, and you can help out in the secondary with your jack. Nice return by Tompkins as he gets ripped down. Well, up high, crossing the 20, no call, a return at 25. LaRon well, Jackson, <laughs> the hammer. He's always in the mix. Action Jackson. <laughs> Brandon Tompkins with a nice return before that hit. Yeah, and he comes out of nowhere, tracks him down. It's just one of those hustle type plays that LaRon seems to make. Brandon Kendall Tompkins. It has been phenomenal this year. Combined for more than 120 catches. Now over 130 on the year. Both the favorite target of Bernard Morris. He guns it over the middle, caught by Kendall. Kendall with space down inside the 15 yard line. Really good job by Carr there to come inside and, and make a block. Such a contrast at the wide receiver position for Orlando. When you look at the two Tompkins twins, obviously not really related, but love to call them the Tompkins twins. They have that ability to quickly catch it and become running backs like we see. But then you've got Greg Carr, you've got Larry Brackens, the big statuesque targets on the outside as well. I think it's a good good mix, a good combination to have, Big Ant. Eight of 17 there. Carr, the motion man. Underneath incomplete intended for Brandon Tompkins. I don't know what the hurry was. Why? I know. I know the pass <laughs> rush is up. Because Joe Sykes, the pass was rush is coming. Down on Bernard Morris. That match between Sykes and Hayworth Hicks throughout the game tonight has been worth all the money these folks have paid to watch these two great players. Hayworth Hicks already in a young career, one of the better edge blockers in the AFL, and Joe Sykes, one of the all-time greats, looking oh. for his 48th career sack. He's the reason. No, He's, no, no, Big Ann. I tell you what, all he had to do was back up a step, keep some separation, and throw the ball to Brandon Tompkins for a big game. Zed was waving you off on that analysis. Meantime, touchdown over the middle. 13 yards, Larry Brackens. You're gonna see him on the nice delay slant route. And he goes in there with a reckless abandon. You see him set it up and throw the DB out. Look at that window that's been created. And right there, you're not stopping him. I don't care how, how hard you hit. Look at that big window right there. Great job by the offensive line. They hold up long enough. And Terrence Smith gets taken again. Hasn't had one of his better nights tonight. Lewis. Knocks it in, 30 to 22, five minutes deep, third quarter. Good looking throw here by Bernard Morris. Connects with Brackens. Brackens is 10th of the season. All right, start fans. Whether you're talking about the labyrinth, Jacob's ladder, the pit, the LOS, we're talking line of scrimmage here with Hayworth Hicks. Uh, your second year in the AFL, the angles that you pass protect from different in this league. You're facing one of the best in Joe Sykes. What was your game plan coming in? Uh, with a person like that, you just got to be aggressive with them. You know, uh, they're not used to people getting all up in them and rushing them and pushing them by. So, I mean, 
game planning wise, you can't really game plan for somebody that's really good. So I mean, just be the more aggressive, and the aggressive person wins. And Bernard Moore is such an athletic quarterback. Does it affect the way for you the how you pass protect? No, because if I told him if I'm running around, you can roll out my way, and it can all be easy that way. It works out. <laughs> Whether you're talking throwing lanes or running lanes, Brent Hayworth Hicks trying to get the job done. No doubt, and Sykes, no sacks tonight, I, only I, one tackle. I tell you what, just to hear him speak like that, just to be more aggressive than he is. You know, a lot of guys wait for guys, and he's bringing the fight right to Joe Sykes. There's Morris who just fired another touchdown to give the Predators an eight-point lead. And Jackson off the net. Achi Jackson in trouble, pushed backwards into his own end zone. Yeah, they mark him. Out at the one, pretty generous, but forward progress. Return of six. Got a block. I mean, you got a free play there. Everybody's blocked. Everybody's blocked. That's just an effort play, blocking on special teams. And really good high kick. Takes a while to get down, which helps out for coverage. And then look at all the white shirts around. There's four white shirts down there. I mean, that's just not a good effort on that return team. From the one, Tommy Grady, 14 of 23 for 130. Grady dumps it off underneath, caught across the 10, crossing the 15-yard line, and that gets him out quickly. A gain of 16, first catch for Jonathan Haggerty. It's a great catch, good job of recognizing coverage. He wanted Tiger deep, comes underneath to the check down Haggerty good job being in the right spot guy making his first play or getting his first playing time first and ten after a big pickup Ross up the left side Ross crossing midfield showing some agility in the predator territory I tell you what it just makes it easy when your guy is this athletic I mean, that's well over 250. I don't know who you're kidding, but the nimbleness, the way he's able to move, and look at the hops. See, if I'm in the front row, I'm bailing at this point. Said. <laughs> that would probably be a good move. Gain of nine. If that was most other players on the field, they would have gone flying into the stands, but not there across. <laughs> Grady dumps it off. The catch by the tight end. Down to the 10 yard line. Bokeet Ruffins gains 14, and the big men getting involved for the Sharks. And I tell you, it keeps the defense off balance. You can't just bear down and bring pressure. See Grady look off and bring it back to Bokeet Ruffin. His fourth catch of the year. He's already got three touchdowns, so he's no, no stranger. When he catches the ball, he usually catches a touchdown. He just ruined his average right there. Mo Ruffins was a defensive lineman at Louisiana Tech. He has morphed into, as the AFL has gone away from the Iron Man in the one-way game, a great offensive weapon. Hills in motion. Grady on first and goal all day. Grady rifles it. Touchdown. separation between the two routes there and you see Harvey continue to work around the front and what makes this play is Mo Ruffins as Anthony just talked about doing a nice job pinning pinning the DN down allowing the big quarterback to slide outside the pocket and make an accurate throw Roush down the middle 30 to 29 with seven to play in the third Tommy Grady buying time beautifully. Steps around surveying the field. Jeremy Gunner's bearing down. And that's the kind of hit you like to get when you can get six. Tommy Grady and the Sharks back to within one. Want access to every AFL game at once? Go to arenafootball.com and click AFL Live for an online broadcast of games around the league via the ESPN3 video player. Or if you're on the go, download the Watch ESPN app to your mobile advice, device, you can get advice and keep up with the AFL action as it happens. 
Grady just slung one into Jerron Harvey, took a hard hit on the back end. Makes it 30 to 29. Taken off the net by Brandon Tompkins. Tompkins escapes one tackle. Another finally spun down at the eight. Well, the Orlando Predators on a three-game winning streak when the night began. May 16th came from a 19-point deficit to beat their I-4 rivals, Tampa Bay, in overtime. Then on May 23rd, pummeled the Portland Thunder by 26 points. And then last week went on the road, one by 19 over the Cleveland Gladiators, the defending champs in the American Conference. They've been on fire. This team has been playing with a lot of passion, playing smart, making great plays, and that's why they've been able to win. We'll see how they respond. This crowd will get up to a fever pitch. We'll see how the Predators respond. Flipped out right side. Brandon Tompkins ripped down by his face mask. And uh, obviously, Anthony will bring you in uh, off that call. <laughs> a flag came out. A bad face Line mask. judge couldn't get his flag out of his pocket, so he threw a, a bean bag. I think we're likely to get a face mask from what happened with Terrence Smith there. Personal foul. Face mask. Defense number 10. 10 yard penalty added to the end of the run. Automatic first down. So 10 yards tacked on as we take a look. Brandon Tompkins just gets ripped down by Terrence Smith. You see him reach out right here, playing off the block. Unintentional, and he goes over and checks on him real quick. But man, that's scary. Anthony, want you to get your take after this play. Take on Bernard Morris and uh, his efforts tonight as he rolls out here, a strike over the middle, it's caught by Carr inside the 15. What do you think of Morris, Anthony? He's been outstanding throughout his career in protecting the football. We've seen an interception from Bernard Morris tonight, but overall, still doing what he can to protect the football, throwing it away from defenders, but where he tends to struggle is being consistent with accuracy. I have seen that, and it's even more noticeable down here at field level. Said. You've seen it plenty throughout his career with the platform that he throws from. The arm action is so quick and concise, but the footwork there and the platform he's throwing from, when that's inconsistent, you see the ball tend to tail on. 15 yards on that pickup. Simons up the middle. Lost the football. Scooped up by the defense of the Sharks. Back to the 21-yard line is Greg Reed. After a big game, huge play from that defense. Right there, it gets stripped out. I think it's Scooter Berry. You're gonna see Scooter Berry knock it out. Greg Reed, Johnny on the spot. Just what the doctor ordered for the Jacksonville Sharks. Four interceptions in his first four games with the Sharks for Reed, the rookie out of Florida State. Now tonight with a big fumble recovery. Quick hitter on the slant, Tiger Jones. Into Orlando territory. Greg Reed, certainly one of the rookie of the year candidates. Only basically a month into his Arena Football League career. Outstanding playmaker and the trust that Les Moss already has in him playing that middle defensive back, that safety position that is the toughest to play on defense in this league. And he was a great return man at Florida State in college, but there's just there's a lot of return man depth on this team with Jackson and Terrence Smith as well. Pushed backwards this time is the fullback Derek Ross. And gained nothing there. And that ball came out. 12 forced turnovers for the Sharks. Last four games, all wins, two tonight as they're trying to make it five victories in a row. Les Moss has got to like what he's seen. And still trying to learn each other offensively, especially down in the red zone, and that's where you don't know what nuances each player has and 
what their strengths are and weaknesses, still trying to learn that. Brady, end zone, Jones, touchdown. When you catch this defense, this is the area back here that you want to attack. Man to man, they're running the corner out. It's corner all the way, he dives in, ball's out on time and accurate. Even with the short corner, the ball comes out early. Great throw, and you see what Tiger does best. Eat up that man to man coverage and then dance in front of him. Extra point good. It started with the defense set. Greg Reed helping turn offense in the point. Scooterberry knocks it out. Greg Reed picks it up on the return. The great throw on the corner route. Tommy Grady to Tiger Jones. Back in Jacksonville, and for the first time here tonight at Seabest Field, the Sharks have a lead in this ball game. Former AFL MVP Tommy Grady, it's been a path for you throughout this season, trying to get on the same page mentally and physically with the wide receivers you're working with. What's it been like? Uh, you know, it's, we've been trying to put it like three different offenses together, and uh, you know, I'm calling them, so I'm just trying to do the best I can. I know we got a lot of guys that want the ball and need the ball, so I'm trying to spread it out as much as possible. But you know, right now our defense is playing great, and uh, we see keep on scoring the offense. And your offense did have some fits and starts in that first half. What's changed so far here in the second? I was trying to take what the defense is giving me. Uh, they're playing a lot of zone right now, so I'm trying to take a lot of the short stuff and let, let our, uh, our fast receivers uh, take the top off the defense. Thanks a lot, Tommy. Brent? Well, it's 36-30. After that touchdown from Tommy Grady, and now Sharks defense will look for a big stop here. Keep the momentum going. And this one off the iron. Picked up by Nick Taylor. And Taylor is hit high as he spins down at the seven. A return of four. Dangerous play there. The Preds fortunate. Sharks with their first lead of the game. It's 36-30. Under three to play in the third. You know, it's interesting, the last play, Holman down there to make the tackle. One of your defensive linemen down there hustling, and that's the unique, one of the unique aspects about this game. Big's got to play on special teams as well. And that sometimes determines whether or not you're going to suit up or sit out for that week. If everything else is even in practice all week. Brandon Tompkins crosses the 10. Pick up a five on first down. This is a well-played game, guys. And I know there's been some turnovers, but I, I prefer to see those, especially tonight, as takeaways from the defense where the offense have played fairly well. But the defenses have taken advantage of almost every mistake the offense has made, and especially up here in the line of scrimmage. An excellent pass rush from Jacksonville, going at it with great pass protectors for Orlando. Morris to Carr. What a nice one-on-one -on -one tackle by Terrence Smith. It's been a, it's been a quiet night. But you watch this route, there's no separation. You got two receivers in the same window. Terrence Smith plays off the deeper receiver and comes downhill. And in the open field, brings Carr down. Smith, Jackson, Greg Reed. Part of that vaunted secondary. Crowd on fire here in Jacksonville tonight. Third down play. Morris fumbled it. Recovered by the Sharks. That's a six-foot, six-foot fumble for Joe Sykes. It appears the decision has been made by the official. They're calling it Jacksonville Sharks football, and I just referenced the ferocious pass rush of the Sharks, smelling blood in the water. Scooter Berry brought the bull rush off the edge, 
and then the sacks came from the opposing side. I believe it was Joe Sykes, but it was so hard with all the jerseys flying across my face, guys, to keep up with it in live action. You're absolutely right, Big Ann. It was Joe Sykes with the arm rip. His sixth force fumble of the year, 13th sack of the season, and he is playing lights out. It's all because the rest of those guys are bringing the pain as well, allowing him to get home. From the seven, Grady slings it Gone. into the end zone. No signal yet. Shark signaling. Officials get together. That's a touchdown, it's a good call. Joe Hills from seven yards out, the strike from Grady. Throwing on time and accurate. Bissell's got together and talked it over. Rob Keith didn't like the call, but it was a touchdown. Roush, the extra point. It's 43-30, Sharks. Kind of a theme for the Sharks here in this third quarter, a turnover that they turn into a touchdown. And, and in their win streak it has, but Bernard Morris, once he bounces outside, Joe Sykes at home right there, takes advantage of Earl Ladson, comes around with the strip, and look at this quick throw right here on the short storm route. Joel Hills doing a great job of body control, spinning around, making the catch at the same time, getting it in the zone. Great pictures from our crew. I mean, if you're, listen, if you're running camera from behind that quarterback and there's a pass rush, things could get dicey, but it could look there. I didn't see any shaking or anything. They're not too scared. No. The 13 point shark lead. Six seconds remaining in the third. 27 to seven, the Sharks have outscored Orlando since halftime. Three of the last Predator offensive possessions, they've turned it over. It would be nice to say this place is in rare form right now, but we've done enough broadcasts here from CBS Field over the years. This is what they do. You guys were in Spokane last week on ESPN2. It's one of the best atmospheres in the league as well. Brandon Tompkins spins the other way. Spins out of trouble. And Tompkins near side 20. Crosses midfield. Nice return by Brandon Tompkins. <laughs> I don't think anybody realized how fast that young man is. That was explosive. End of the third quarter. Brandon Tompkins trying to trying to change the momentum back in the Predators' favorite a little bit here. An electrifying return, but all sorts in that third. Been a fun night here in Jacksonville. Momentum has switched since halftime, and Tommy Grady Sharks leading by 13. As we start the fourth in our quarterback comparison, Grady now is thrown for 220, four touchdowns, and he's really overcome those two early picks that he threw. Uh, he's been real efficient with the football, and, and it helps when your defense has been as dominant as they have, getting you back possession, getting ball in good field position, allowing you to go out and make plays and feel comfortable doing so. Predators got to get things back on their side. Dump off. Simon's out of the backfield, and he's chopped down at the 21-yard line. A gain of three. So you got one guy to go get. You got to go get the jack. If you're the guard or the center, you got to get out and get the jack out in front. That's a big play if they get him blocked. 
Seabest Field in Jacksonville. Orlando, the Road Whites, Jacksonville Home Blacks. Brent Stover with a Hall of Famer set Bonner, Anthony Heron down on the sidelines. Battle at the top of the South Division, the American Conference. The Predators lead the division, they lead the Sharks by a game, and they're gonna get Greg Carr down inside the five before he's twisted down as this first place Predator team trying to come from behind in the fourth. Narachi Jackson down the field for the Sharks. Seventeen yard gain. Terrence Smith was down as well. And I don't know you're on field level big end but to me that's the first time I've seen Greg Carr hit something full stride trying to get it done. And you know he's been out of the lineup for a while said he's still coming back trying to get back in game shape and one of the things Rob Keefe said was wanting to know that he could trust Greg Carr to be utilized on special teams as well. It takes so much energy to do both. Handoff Simons in the end zone. Touchdown Orlando from two yards out. And that's a quick answer. I mean, we talked about Hayworth Hicks, but Earl Latson is another big man, 6'6", 335. Will Maxwell, these guys just get push up front. And Michael Simons. Simons punches it in, extra point Lewis. Early fourth, six point game. Friday night at 10 Eastern, we're in Spokane, Washington for more arena football action. The Las Vegas Outlaws and the Spokane Shock. Friday night, 10 Eastern, CBS Sports Network. The Outlaws, the expansion team off to a two and one start, but they have sputtered since trying to get back on track. But that is a tough environment similar to this one here tonight at Seabest Field. Or they have been alive from the outset. Lewis to send it away. This time Greg Reed back deep. Just over the wall and underneath the iron. And it's a touchback. Forty three thirty seven early fourth. A ton of importance on this one in the South Division of the American Conference. The Predators a game clear of this shark team. Six and four Orlando five and five Jacksonville. Sharks going for their first win inside the division. The soul the biggest story in the American now ten and one after their victory earlier tonight. Well you look at that Jacksonville being the only team in the South Division without a win. No, right. Orlando, if they get this win, they go to 4-0, and, oh, and they're pretty much in the driver's seat now. And Jacksonville or Orlando or somebody else is bobbling grab on the turf after the 10. Unseat the Gladiators, who had so many miracle wins last year to make it all the way to Arena Bowl 28. But the Gladiators only 5-5 five and five right now. Well, they're, you know, Teron Lewis is in L.A. now. Verace Jackson's no longer there. They've lost some pieces. Still a quality team, but haven't been able to have the success that they had a year ago. Second five for Grady. Hills in high motion. Hills near boards. Out to the 15-yard line. What are you seeing uh, down there, Big Ant? Seeing Tommy Grady looking more comfortable, the pass rush from the Orlando Predators has struggled at times, especially off the edge. I spoke to Jeremy Gethers just before the game tonight. He's struggling with a strained calf muscle. We saw on one of those touchdown passes in the third quarter where he was chasing Grady around the edge, and Grady is certainly not a fast guy, but Jeremy Gethers couldn't quite catch him. So the Predators' pass rush not quite as effective tonight as they've been in recent weeks. Grady head off Derek Ross gains a couple. Listen in here to Tommy Grady call his own plays. Near right. Let me get a short one. Near right. Huh? Right. 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 Right.
Let's go right lazy. D back. Let's go 32. Uh, let's go 30 short zone. Hold on. 30, 30. You're going to look for the go route on the outside. The motion man, Tiger Jones, will run a quick five yard out. Joe Hills will run up the boards, up the sideline. Haggerty in there as well as they connect to Tiger Jones, who gets absolutely drilled by Emmanuel Cook. But a gain of five makes it third and short. I'll tell you, if, if Tommy Grady can hang on to that ball for a split second and really maybe throw a pump fake out there, both secondary players drop down. He's got a chance. Emmanuel Cook comes off of Joe Hills. But a big time catch by Tiger Jones. Grady able to get rid of it at the last moment. Barreling down on him was Austin Brown. Austin Brown shoots underneath right there. You're going to see penetration. Raymond McNeil gets pushed back, gets bull rushed right. Watch this area right here. Tommy wants to throw it, but gets tripped up by his own guy. And Big Ant, you're down there at field level. How did that penetration 30, look to you? 51 pitch. It's one, of the things that, hurry, hurry, it's one of the things Austin Brown is so effective at. He's got the power to be able to collapse the pocket strictly with the ball, which is most effective from the nose, but he likes to use the quickness more often than not. And fourth and three, Grady lofts it up. Tiger Jones hauls it in. Touchdown. And then take off again and watch his delivery. Watch a quick stutter. Takes off. Delivery over the outside edge. Great concentration. Great throw. And that's just not fair when you get a guy to get in and out of his cuts that fast. When he stops his feet, he can start back up. Great looking play call. Roush, the extra point. The Sharks lead is back to 13. 9 4 to play in the game. Tiger, nice concentration. Tiger Jones, 10 catches for 136. Just caught his third touchdown. And the lead is 50 to 37 for the Jacksonville Sharks, bidding for their fifth straight win tonight. He is just one of the most entertaining players as well because when he scores it's going to be an orchestrated <laughs> ensemble and, and the big guys will and, be involved and the big guys get involved that's the one thing you got to give him credit for he gives his big guys a lot of love and they get in on the dance celebration Tompkins to take this one hit one of the fans it's a live ball though Flag down, Tompkins gets the near edge. And out to the 17. Didn't that come off of a fan's hands? It looked like he was, re the fan was reaching for it. During the return, holding. Returning team, number one. Half the distance to the goal, first down. Either way, it's a hold on Larry Brackens. Not so sure it, it hit the fan, but. That's tough when that ball's line driving there like that. Did that hit iron or I fan? think it hit iron. It is very hard to tell. Yeah, oh, iron, there you go. Oh, that was iron. I don't know, that would have ricocheted out a little further. That could have been fan. Right? Yeah. The bounce? I'll go with it. Brandon Tompkins in motion. Morris slings it, caught. Greg Carr. Spun down at the 14. Gain of 11. Orlando with 65 points per game during this three game winning streak. Only 37 so far tonight for Morris and company. 
Morris over the top, nobody there. Craig Reed trying to chase that one down. And there, there's something wrong with this play. There's something wrong with this play from the get-go. Your motion man's back here, and you really never send him. Or you forget he's back there, which in any case, it's no good. So now it's four on two in the secondary. Very fortunate Reed didn't run back there and pick that ball up. We talked about his punt return abilities in college. He looked like he was flying back for one. And second down, Morris steps up, fires, incomplete. It was tipped, and now a late marker in the secondary. The ball was tipped, therefore there is no foul for pass interference. No doubt. That's why Terrence Smith was very animated pleading his case. I think it's Alvin Ray Jackson, the Jack linebacker, who's just eyeballing Bernard Morris. He's able to get his hands up there. And it's one of those moments. Third and ten, you got another down, you know they're gonna go for it, but you get a sense with a with a bad play here, this game can get out of hand. Third and ten. Morris runs. Morris gets the first down into short territory. And the lane was created as the defensive end worked his way up the field. And what I love about what Bernard Morris did right there was that he climbed the pocket as a quarterback. We haven't seen him choose to use his leg very often tonight. Alvin Ray Jackson appeared towards the right side of the box. And so Bernard Morris, as he climbed the pocket, the running lane appeared towards his left. And that's what he took advantage of. Morris dumps it off, dropped by Simons. And that play just happened so fast, Big Ann. You're down there, field level. Didn't look like they gave the screen enough time to set up. Happened way too fast. Not enough guys drawn in to make it happen. And what we're seeing a bit is that the pass rush from Jacksonville, especially on the edge where they've been bringing it throughout the night. See Jerry Turner, Joe Sykes, they're a bit gassed right now. So it's more difficult to try and fit that screen pass between the edge rushers when they're not really getting up the field. Morris, Carr, Carr, Craig Carr reaches. Touchdown. That's an outstanding play from Bernard Morris, and then the effort on the end from Greg Carr finishes it off. I mean, getting to see it from the vantage point I'm at, seeing his presence in the pocket is where the play initially starts at because he can feel the rush around him, but the eyes stay downfield. And so where he shows the threat of the defense that he may run at the last moment, he throws the football to a wide-open Greg Carr. Job wasn't done there as Carr had to finish the run in the paint. And Big Ann, I think it's something you mentioned the previous play where he climbed up in the pocket around pressure as a quarterback. He climbed as a quarterback with throwing it in mind. Allowed his receiver, Greg Carr, to make a play for him on the other end of that. Outstanding play by both these young men. 23-yard connection. Morris to Carr, 50 to 44. Tybo three remaining. Tight game. As we head down the stretch in this pivotal game in the South Division. The Predators lead the Sharks by one game. And an onside kick picked up by Brackens. Didn't go close to 10 Nothing. Yards. That's Nothing. One. I mean, Mark Lewis has, has got a great ensemble of onside kicks. That is not one of his best.
The kick did not travel 10 yards and was illegally touched by the kicking team. Ball belongs to Jacksonville at the dead ball spot. So Grady back out there. I know it's too much time left to, to try and stall and, and not score and get points. However, with one Mr. Derek Ross, you do want to probably get a couple run plays here on this drive. And if he breaks one, so be it. If you get a couple of running plays allowed to burn some clock and then punch it in, it would help the cause. Grady from the seven gives to Ross. Chance to burn some of that clock. Again, at one minute, we'll get the one minute warning. And at that point, you get the outdoor rules in terms of clock stoppages. Except for the must gain forward progress. Exactly. Which we'll get into. It's funny, you see a lot of these quarters where it just flies and flies, and then all of a sudden you get down to one minute and, and it just kind of it is a completely different ball game. Slows down. And it's all about game management at that point. Hills comes in motion, they blow it dead. Delay of game, offense number four, five yard penalty, second down. Pretty unacceptable at you, this point. You cannot have that. Les Moss again, head coach, dealing with some injury issues of his own, so coaching from up in the box. Clock keeps rolling at 340. Grady hits near side to Ron Harvey. Down to the five yard line and a gain of seven and the clock continues to roll at three and a half minutes left in the game. We're not quite at the point yet in the fourth quarter where I believe the Orlando defense would think about just allowing Jacksonville to score. There's a point where defensively in the AFL you start to consider that. We're not there yet with still over three minutes remaining on the clock. Rob Keep and his defense are thinking stop on third down. Well, timeouts with. I would agree. I think inside of two minutes, Big Ant. You said both teams with three timeouts remaining. Tiger Jones was the motion man. They lofted it up. Caught touchdown. Joe Hills. Tommy Grady took a shot to the chops on that one. Really a good job by Joe Hills to keep working. Watch him fight and get around the back of that end zone and finish the play with power. And Grady stumbles and then takes it to the chops. He regathers his feet and just flicks it out there. And Calvin Fans takes him to the deck, but he'll take that shot all day for the touchdown. Lead back to 13. With 2.16 remaining. The Sharks have been phenomenal in this second half. They were down 23-16. And they made some uh, successful adjustments to me, to say the least. How about you just play consistent, and play hard, and not make mistakes? And they were three of seven on their possessions in the first half, and they've just come out on fire in the second half. Defense has played lights out. Has forced Orlando into some bad mistakes. Again, the Predators lead the South Division. They are six and four. The Sharks in second place, one game back at five and five. They're 0 and three in division. This is huge. And that they get this division win. They're 0 and three in the division, and Orlando three and 0 in the division. And this would, would be huge for Jacksonville. Deepest division in the Arena Football League. I believe deepest at the quarterback position as well, which is why all three teams are so good. Brandon Tompkins off the net. 
Tompkins knocked into the boards at the eight. In the American Conference, Philadelphia leads the East by a wide margin over the defending American Conference champs, the Gladiators. And in the South, the Preds six and four, the Sharks five and five, the Storm four and five. After those division winners, it's the next two, regardless of division, that make the playoffs. So theoretically, the Sharks, and all three teams out of the South, Preds, Sharks, and Storm could could make the playoffs. Both of these teams on a winning streak. So Orlando has won three in a row. The Sharks four in a row. And they blow it dead. False start. Offense, number 78. Half the distance to the goal. First down. That's that noise, huh? Well, we talked about with Coach, Coach Keith talked about in the meeting this morning that Sometimes the old veterans on that D-line from Jacksonville like to bark out signals and cadences. And as loud as it is in here, they can force you into some mistakes where they just get Earl Lanson right there with a false start. in the end zone. That's a safety! And it's a safety. This is the 10th consecutive game for the league leader in sack, Joe Sykes. To grab the quarterback in the backfield while he has the football in his hands. He's shown the power tonight. He's shown the counter move. But his main move, when he knows it's cold crush depth, is the speed off the edge. I mean, and it's not often we talk about a guy that he comes out and dominates and performs like he has the second half. He has been lights out. Two forced fumbles, two sacks. This one turning into points for the team. And I'm gonna go ahead and throw it out there, Big Ant. He is right now. The defensive player of the year in the clubhouse. It's the angle that he's able to rush at that's so impressive. Because as an edge rusher, it's one thing to have a great first step getting up the field, but he can bend the corner in a way that doesn't allow the edge blocker on offense to go down and get him. And he's a big guy. He's ever been a 6'5, 290. He stood right next to him during the pregame, but he's able to rush the corner at an angle where he bends the corner in a way that edge blocker just can't go down there and get him. The speed, the power, the ability to rush low with pad level, it's almost unstoppable. Full-blown party here at Seabest Field. 59-44 onside kick, Hills couldn't handle. And the Preds. As soon as it hits the wall, it's, it's dead. So, shark football. They had a great opportunity there. Again, weren't able to get it. That, now, that's more like a Mark Lewis type kick. And the Preds needed that one, to say the least. 110 remaining here in Jacksonville. Is everything in this second half working in their favor? I mean, the crowd is into it. They've been great offensively, made some big plays. And the defense, man, I mean, lights out. That was the story off the top. The offense of the Preds, the defense of the Sharks. In this second half, it's been all Sharks on both sides of the football. Joe Sykes making his presence felt all night.
historically, the best defense in the AFL has been out in San Jose. But I got to say tonight, guys, here at Seabest Field, this Jacksonville Sharks defense has put in work. The man has led the way is Joe Sykes. You called the rest of your defense over here, Joe. Yeah, yeah. You put up outstanding numbers. What do these guys mean to you with the way you're able to play for them? I love them, man. If it weren't for them, I wouldn't be doing this. So I want my whole unit here. You know what I'm saying? We're a unit. We're a team. And your partner on the opposite edge here. I'm going to stay with the defensive end since I played that spot. Jerry Turner. Right. Joe may lead the league in sacks. You brought it off the opposing edge. What was the matchup like for you tonight? Hey, man. It's, 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 it's whatever it want to be, man. I mean, both sides. Joe do his job. I try to do my job. We try to do our job in the middle. And it is what it is, you know. Try to much rush against Bernard to make him throw the ball and not run it. And that's what we did. And now he got out on one run. Now you reference Bernard Morris. Where the route go? Here he is. <laughs> Mr. Jackson, you know most of these guys really well. You were on a championship contending team last season. Do you feel like this unit has arena bowl potential? Oh, yeah, most definitely, man. We, we play together. You know, no matter the adversity we go through, man, we never quit. And we got that same mentality that the team in Cleveland has. That go one and no every play, every down. So that what we doing, man. We sticking to it and it's working, man. No matter what's going on, we keep fighting. A lot of similarities I'm seeing, guys, between this unit and what we saw from the Cleveland Gladiators last season. Even have that yes chant going. <laughs> Another run by Ross. Two timeouts remaining for the Preds. They call this one. So now one remaining for Orlando with 53 seconds. I think this team is far more gifted and, and there's a lot of similarities, but this is a far more talented team than that Cleveland team. However, they are just now starting to gel, just start to understand how to play together and how to win close games together and how to close games out together and how to do all those things. Start going for it makes you do a self-check. You got to look in the mirror and see what you're doing or what you're not doing to help your team win. And I feel like this team has enough leaders and enough veteran players for Coach Moss to take that look and, and, and make sure things get turned around. And they've turned it around big time. Again, it's Ross moving forward and down inside the one. So now the Predators burn their final timeout with 48 seconds. So what do you do with the Sharks? Because you got to move it forward. Coming well, out now, of here. Now just, you go just, ahead and score. Just I mean, get the touchdown. Now you go ahead and score. I mean, it's fourth down. You got to go ahead and try to punch it in. It looked like they were about to send the field goal unit on, and there's no reason to do that. Go punch that thing in. Finish the game off the right way. Obviously fourth down as well, so really nowhere to go but in the end zone and, and depending the extra point, be up by 22. So here it is on fourth and goal, Orlando out of timeouts. Grady gives Derek Ross touchdown. Third of the night for Ross. Here comes a lawnmower. You <laughs> knew it was coming just a matter of time. I mean, he is just too powerful, too quick with his feet. And each week that goes by that this team has success, they get more and more confident. And with all the talented players, man, look out. Roush makes it 66-44, 46 seconds remaining, and no timeouts left for the Predators. The Sharks, barring a miracle, will uh, pull into a first-place tie, both teams 6-5. And they will be one and one against each other this season. I mean, that's that's America's favorite, right? The lawnmower. It's been around for a few years. Back in the Philly days. He's not going to dance, but he's he's definitely going to hit that lawnmower. And cut the grass for you. 
Fans of the exits, this uh, this was an electric atmosphere tonight. This was, a Big Ant mentioned earlier, a well-played game, awesome crowd. I mean, this is arena football, exactly what you want. Absolutely, an intimate setting. And packed house, fans involved and into what's happening. Guys going over the wall a few times. Yeah. Big time plays, big hits, physicality. I mean, this was a great game. Everything you wish for. There's certain ingredients that end up making up a championship team. When you look at where Jacksonville started at with their own four starts of the season, and they faced that adversity, now a team that's starting to gel, adding some key elements to what they do offensively and defensively. I'll tell you what, even a rookie like Greg Reed, the teammates have so much confidence in what he's able to do as well. Brandon Tompkins on the return out over the 10. 41 seconds left. And Orlando needs a miracle here. We're back in Jacksonville here on CBS Sports Network just a few weeks from now. And tell you what, this is a good spot to be, especially now. This will be five straight wins and six of their last seven. Their atmosphere is electric. Be in Spokane next weekend, a lot like Spokane with this atmosphere. Morris launches deep for Kendall Tompkins. Timing wow. catch wow. in the end zone. 38 yards. So if you're going to make a miracle comeback, it's a good start there. Holy cow. Did you see that? Watch him turn his head and run. Watch him duck, turn his head, and take off. Runs by the double coverage and then lays out. And then a dust up in the end zone. We've seen a few of them. It began before kickoff during warm ups. These two teams going at it. We've seen a handful of them throughout the game. Listen, if you're Jacksonville, you shouldn't be involved with anything. You, you, you just want to be involved with putting 66 up, getting the win, getting out of here. You shouldn't be involved with any kind of skirmishes, possibly getting anybody hurt or possibly suspended where they can't play next week if something really breaks out. You gotta be smarter than that. It's precisely right, said it's where the maturity of a football team has to show itself. We certainly respect that Orlando's still playing this game. Dead ball, personal foul, offense number one. Ten yard penalty will be enforced after the kickoff. Well that kills you. So if you do get the onside kick, recover it, then you're backed up. It'll only be half the distance. So yeah, I mean, good point. <laughs> but still, I mean, those, I mean, Lewis knocks in. It's a two-possession game, right? I mean, 35 seconds. We've seen a lot time. of things happen during the football. I mean, he just he looked, turned his head, and ran, and then just laid out. I mean, that was an exceptional catch, an exceptional effort. And the two DBs couldn't believe he made the play either because they were just kind of standing there. So we got an onside kick. If you recover and punch it in quickly again, then the onside kick again. It's a it's a two-possession game. It, it it's a two-score game. It is doable. You would need a touchdown or an extra point and a touchdown or a two-point conversion. And that 21-point comeback that we witnessed between Orlando and Tampa Bay just several weeks back on CBS Sports Network in the one I-4. There was more time remaining than this <laughs> when they were down by three scores, but it is most certainly possible. Well, you need a few breaks, Big N, as you know, but uh, sometimes when you're playing hard and, and continuing to play, that's when you get those type of breaks. They need and, Lewis and to have a phenomenal. you're Jacksonville, you can't relax. You've got to stay on the gas and stay focused. The onside from Lewis, they blew it dead. Had to get Terrence Smith on the field, and that's one of those plays. It's a mental play, timeout. stay focused. Jacksonville, first charge timeout of the half, a 30-second timeout. 
So they will have two remaining, Jacksonville, as they call time. Les Moss. He know he wants to be down on the field right now. Right. He, wa he wants to relay messages immediately instead of having to send it by airmail through 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 the phone lines. Sometimes they don't get there exactly how you want them to get there. We're giving those messages. So here it is, onside. Nice high hop, and they got a chance. It's loose, but it bounces right into the hands of Gregory. That's the third time they had the perfect hit. They were able to get through the front line and get to Joe Hills and take him out before he got to the ball. And then they weren't able to recover. That's a great kick right there by Mark Lewis. The front line of Jacksonville is supposed to protect. You're supposed to protect first as the ball goes up. And they're not able to do it, but a fortuitous battle. I mean, to say the least. I mean, that thing on. completely changed directions and hits Reed right in the lap. No timeouts left for the Preds, so the Sharks will just, just need to move the ball forward and run it out. The Sharks at Tampa. And Cleveland on the road against Portland, home against Philly and Tampa again. Again, got to get forward motion, so you can't take a knee here. Ross does that. He lost the ball, huh? Orlando says it was knocked loose, but it's Philadelphia next for the Preds and at Arizona. And that'll run out the clock. Jacksonville wins 66-51. The Sharks have won five straight and six of their last seven after starting 0-4. The Preds' three-game winning streak comes to an end. We got a tie at the top of the South. Both of these teams at six and five. Five straight for the Sharks. For Sed Bonner, Anthony Heron, and our entire CBS crew, I'm Brent Stover. This has been a presentation of CBS Sports Network the 24-hour home of CBS Sports. Our next Arena Football broadcast, Friday, 10 Eastern, for the Outlaws and the Spokane Shop. So long from Seabest Field here in Jacksonville.